Next, on Accident Investigator. A detective and a medical examiner joined forces to unravel the mysterious circumstances surrounding a teenager's bizarre death. The true puzzle was going to be, how did she die? And if someone's at fault in this, how much are they at fault? Then, a pregnant woman is killed after her car is rear-ended at high speed. But what investigators can't figure out is why the other driver never hit the brakes. There's hundreds of yards of sight distance. Why did this car drive into the back of this other car? And a veteran bus driver is found dead under his own bus. But with no witnesses and few clues, police fear they may have been dealt an impossible case. Could have been a mechanical failure, or someone could have driven the bus over the top of the victim. Every year, violent collisions kill 3,000 Canadians and injure another 200,000. But there is no such thing as an accident. Every collision has a story, as unique as the people involved. Rusty Haight is a leading authority on accident reconstruction. He trains investigators around the world to read the clues and solve the mysteries. When it comes to eyewitnesses, we're talking about dealing with human perception. For an accident investigator, that can be tricky. OK, so you just saw a crash. Can you tell me who might have been braking? Are you absolutely sure? Let's look at it again. OK, you got to see it a second time. Did you pick up any other details? That's what I was saying about human perception. It can be tricky. Even witnesses with the best of intentions can miss details. That's when it falls to the accident investigator to sort out fact from fiction. But that job becomes more difficult when, for whatever reason, one of the witnesses is trying to hide part of the truth. It's a warm Saturday afternoon, and 16-year-old Sienna Ashton finally surfaces after spending most of the day in her room with her boyfriend, Mark. Oh, Sienna, I would like to talk to you. Sienna's Sienna. mom, Rhonda, doesn't even have the time to ask where they're going before the teenagers are out the door. Lately, Mark has occupied almost all of Sienna's time, and Rhonda misses spending the occasional weekend with her only daughter. But her stomach turns to ice when she hears the sound of screeching tires outside the house. She flings the door open and is confronted with every mother's worst fear. Her only daughter's body lies motionless on the side of the road. When Sergeant Rod Sadler arrives on the scene, Sienna's body is still there. When I got there, there were two or three other people standing around. The mother was very, very distraught, as you can imagine. I mean, I have two children myself. I can't imagine what it would be like to hold one of them as they were dying um, as a result of a car crash. Sienna has already been pronounced dead by emergency personnel. The true puzzle was going to be, how did she die? And if someone's at fault in this, how much are they at fault? Rob's first step is to have a look at the body. Oftentimes, even a quick visual analysis can provide critical clues. I suspected that there was probably massive broken ribs on her right side, and there was also uh, deep abrasions on her left hip. Injuries on two different sides of the body um, seemed a little unusual. But only an autopsy will reveal exactly how Sienna died. Rod photographs the injuries and immediately sends Sienna's body to the medical examiner's office. Then, just as he's ready to begin his inspection of the crash scene, a shouting match between two young men grabs his attention. Mark, Sienna's boyfriend, is arguing with another young man who has been identified as Robert Stewart. I looked over and saw two young men basically in a verbal discussion about who was at fault and, and what had happened. Those young men are Rod's two only witnesses, and right away, he suspects that they won't give him the same story. It was obvious that they didn't agree on how it happened. First, Rod pulls Sienna's boyfriend aside to get his version of the story. We were just walking down the side of the street. We were going down to the corner store. I mean, we the 17-year-old we were... tells him that he and Sienna were walking on the side of the road, when all of a sudden, they heard a car coming towards them. Mark maintains that the car was coming so fast, Sienna didn't have time to move out of the way before getting hit from behind. The driver continued on, but seemed to lose control of his car and slammed into a tree just a short distance down the road. Just 
seems to, you know, I guess he's Mark describes a classic hit and run, and that leaves Rod wondering. Although he only had a quick look at Sienna's injuries, they are not consistent with a typical pedestrian crash, especially from behind at high speed. I would have expected to see some broken lower limbs, uh, broken legs. Uh, depending on how tall that person was in relation to the vehicle, there might be some head injury from, for instance, that person wrapping around the front of the car, striking the windshield. In this particular case, there was none of that. There was basically the injury to the right rib cage and the left hip, which was very unusual. It just didn't, it didn't seem to gel with the stories that were starting to come out. But maybe they were fighting me. The driver has a totally different version of events. Robert Stewart admits that he was driving the car, but he swears that he was not trying to flee the scene because he didn't even know he'd hit Sienna. Stewart stated that he had stopped he knew them, he pulled over, they were on the side of the road. He was showing off. He was accelerating away from the scene in an effort to show off to her. Stuart told me that she must have been hanging on to the A-pillar and he accelerated and he didn't realize it, maybe because it's slightly behind the driver's seat. He lost control and drove off the road and hit a tree. Only when he got out of the vehicle to look at the damage did he realize that he had taken someone along for the ride. It was possible that that could happen, that someone could actually be dragged and not let go on a car. But I went and looked at the car, and there was no handprints, no evidence of anyone grasping onto the car. Robert Stewart's story doesn't explain Sienna's injuries either. If she was hanging out of the car and hit the tree, as Stewart claims, her head and shoulders would have shown signs of impact. But Rod didn't notice any injuries above the shoulder at all. Now it's clear that the investigation will rely heavily on the autopsy report. The injuries in this case may very well tell the tale but Rod has a hunch there's something else the two young men are not telling him. As a next step, he examines the scene for any physical evidence that can help explain what happened. What he finds next could move the case into a completely different and unexpected direction. As I'm looking around the car, I find a bag of marijuana laying very near to the car. It's obvious it hasn't been there for very long. Rod knows he's on to something. Dead bodies and drugs are not usually a coincidence. I confront both Mark and Stuart. I tell them I know they're not being truthful. I know that the drugs are involved somehow in this and that it's just not adding up with what they're telling me. And they finally both change their stories and begin to tell the same story. According to both young men, it was Sienna who called Stewart yeah. and asked him to come over in hopes of selling him drugs. When Stewart pulled up to the front of her house, Sienna walked over to the car while her boyfriend kept an eye out for passers-by, especially the police. After a brief conversation, oh, Sienna leaned through the driver's window to pass the bag to Stewart, but Stewart was not planning on paying. As soon as he had the drugs in his hand, he stepped on the gas and took off. Then, only a couple of hundred feet down the street, he quickly lost control and slammed into a tree. Stewart maintained that she was hanging on to the car when he drove away and that he didn't realize it until after he had hit the tree. If he actually didn't know that she was hanging on to the car, then that would be a valid defense if you were charged criminally with some sort of a homicide. If she was positioned in the car and he knew it and he maybe intentionally tried, for lack of a better term, wiping her off the side of the car by running up against a tree, then we have maybe a first degree murder charge. Mark can't confirm or contradict this version of events. He confesses to taking part in the drug deal but insists that he did not see the actual crash. So it becomes really critical 
to figure out how she's positioned. Next, Rod takes a fresh look at the scene. There's a skid mark that runs for 148 feet before the vehicle veers off the road and comes within an inch or two of a tree. The tree is slightly deformed, and looking at it closely, Rod sees fabric that looks like denim. Before he goes any further, Rod decides to call the morgue where Sienna's body was transferred. He needs to know exactly what kind of pants she was wearing and whether they match the fabric he found on the tree. Brian Hunter, the medical examiner, answers the phone. Accident investigators and medical examiners often work closely as a team to crack complex crash cases like this one. And the right ribs. Without his theory, you can't go any further than with just the injuries. Um, you know they're lethal. You know they occurred prior to death. It's reasonable that a car was involved, but you can't go any further. When he puts that in, then I can put my piece in, and uh, it, it just proves how essential that teamwork is. Dr. Hunter quickly confirms that Sienna was wearing jeans. In fact, her pants are torn, and they are very dirty. For Rod, this seems to support Robert Stewart's story that Sienna's body was thrown into the side of the tree. But it doesn't explain the strange injury pattern. At this point in the investigation, I have acceleration marks uh, for a short distance that lead off the road, um, come very near to a tree, and then I have the car up against a, another tree. I have a dead 16-year-old girl, and I have an unusual injury pattern on her. I have a suspect and a witness who both now are telling pretty much the same story. The piece of the puzzle that I'm looking for is, was she hanging on to the car, or was she positioned differently? Coming up, Sienna's genes provide even more compelling clues for the investigation. So those became literally a critical piece of evidence. Accident investigator Rod Sadler is grappling with one of the most unusual cases in his 20-year career. 16-year-old Sienna Ashton is dead after a bizarre car accident that witnesses describe as a drug deal gone bad. The suspect claims that she must have hung on to the side of the car as he tried to make off with a bag of marijuana. But he didn't realize what was going on until his car slammed into a tree further up the road. If investigators can't prove differently, this case could be ruled accidental. But to Detective Sadler, the pieces are still not fitting together. Okay. I looked at her injury pattern, and things aren't adding up. Stewart's story still does not explain why Sienna suffered virtually no injuries to her back or head, a likely outcome if she was dragged up against the tree from the outside of the car. It's Rod's job to untangle this mystery. The piece of the puzzle that I'm looking for that I can't yet find, and that is, how did she die? Where was she in relation to this vehicle? What caused her death? Was she hanging on to the car, or was she positioned differently? Rod now needs to examine the car. He's pretty sure that the vehicle will give him a clue as to what happened. The car is quite dirty but there are two long rectangular bare spots on the driver's door. Rod remembers the medical examiner, Dr. Hunter, talking about how dirty Sienna's jeans were. You see these marks here? These are very interesting. Something has brushed against this car very recently. See how the dirt's been disturbed here and it's wiped clean? That is probably an imprint maybe from Sienna's thighs. This suggestion that Sienna's legs could have been pressed right up against the driver's side door of the car is a major finding. Rod formulates a provocative theory as to how the accident may have really gone down. My opinion was that she was partially in the vehicle when he accelerated. She was crushed between the car and the tree. This scenario would have major implications for the driver, Robert Stewart. If Sienna was actually partway in the vehicle at any time during the accident, it would be nearly impossible for Stewart to claim that he didn't see her. 
there was no way that she could have been holding on to the car, and there's no way that Stuart could not have known that her body was in the car when he accelerated. If her thighs are pressed against the driver's door, then there's only one place her torso can be, and that's in the car. But the prints on the door are not enough. Rod will need concrete medical evidence that shows Sienna was not dragged and thrown, but rather that her hips collided sideways into the tree. I had to contact the medical examiner. I couldn't wait two or three months for his report. He starts to present his findings to support that. And now I start to look, re-look at the pattern of injury. I've already looked at it once, twice. Now I'm re-looking at it with this new history and trying to decide whether it fits. And it really did fit. So a lot of things made sense. It's sort of a rotational pattern. The abrasion on the left hip made sense for contact with a tree. The abrasion on the side made sense for a scrape along the edge of the window frame. A lot of things made sense. It's sort of a rotational pattern. Scrape against the door frame, scrape against the tree. So that all made sense. I take his opinion, put it together with mine, and it's like locking two pieces of the puzzle together. With all the pieces in place, Rod Sadler can now replay the chain of events that led to Sienna's death. Sienna Ashton and her boyfriend Mark arrange a meeting with Robert Stewart in the hopes of selling him some marijuana. But as Sienna leans into the car to complete the transaction, Stewart has a change of heart. He grabs the bag and accelerates. Tragically, Sienna remains stuck inside the vehicle, her upper body leaning halfway across the driver's seat and her legs dangling outside the window. Then Stewart's car leaves the road and sideswipes a large tree. Sienna's upper body is immediately sandwiched between car and tree, causing massive internal injuries. She dies almost instantly. The case goes to trial. Sienna's boyfriend is not charged, but Robert Stewart is convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to spend between two and 15 years behind bars. It's really like a, a scientific experiment. You, you form your hypothesis, and then you try to prove it and you anticipate the outcome. And that's what we did. Coming up, an accident investigator is determined to uncover the truth behind a series of unexplained crashes. I wasn't gonna quit. That, that just motivated me more to go and do the things that I needed to do. When you get behind the wheel of a car, you're entering into a contract with society. You're saying you understand the machine can be dangerous and you're going to use it responsibly. Never thought of it that way? Well, remember, a car by itself is never going to hurt anyone. What the driver does or doesn't do will. It's an ordinary Saturday morning, and Jody Morris is on her way to the mall. She's seven months pregnant, but neither she nor her husband, Rick, have had time to do much shopping. Today, she'll be looking to load up on clothes and supplies for the new baby. But as she slows down to stop at an intersection, she's startled by a loud noise coming from behind her. Glancing in her rearview mirror, she sees a car bearing down on her at full speed. There's no time to react, and no way that car is going to stop before it hits her. Homicide detective Robert Keenan arrives 45 minutes after the crash. Jody Morris and her unborn child have already been pronounced dead. Jody's crushed body has been stuck between the seat and the steering wheel. The seconds that it took for this vehicle to be crushed at the speed, Miss Morris never had a chance. The driver of the other car is on his way to the hospital. He is unconscious. Both his legs and one of his wrists are broken and he has abrasions caused by the airbag deploying. I looked and I seen the distance that the vehicles had traveled and right off the top of my head. It was, I knew speed was involved. The other thing that bothered me greatly was when I went back to the point of impact to look, there were no skid marks, none at all. The absence of any skid marks is a real mystery. There's plenty of other physical evidence, shattered glass, car parts, and other debris, but absolutely no signs of breaking. Certainly when I see no skid marks and I see all this damage, why? Why did this 
this car drive into the back of this other car. There's hundreds of yards of sight distance. You couldn't miss her, she's sitting there. Robert's first job is to determine exactly how fast the striking vehicle was traveling when it hit Jody's car. The whole back end was shoved up to the back of the front seat. Investigators usually analyze skid marks to help calculate speed. But in this instance, he'll need to use a measurement called crush damage. In Robert's crash, the back end of the car was crushed 54 inches. That's an enormous amount of crush damage. Let me show you what it looks like. We're about right there. So this car would be collapsed from here all the way to right about there. Let's see how close I can come in this wreck. That was only at 35 miles an hour. Imagine if I was going a bunch faster, twice, or even three times faster. The crush damage on this car would have been significantly worse. As it is, a lot of crush. Robert estimates that Powers rear-ended Jody's car at 70 miles per hour. Robert photographs, measures, and documents the site. But he leaves the crash scene with more questions than answers. Now he has the difficult task of telling Rick Morris that his pregnant wife has been killed. You do prepare yourself, but there's times when you sit back and reflect and you think about the things that you've had to do, especially in this job. It gets to you. You're not human if it doesn't. Everything he had in life, a beautiful wife, a new child, was gone in the blink of an eye. This man drove into the back of that woman and it was gone in a split second. Detective Keenan next makes his way to the hospital to meet the driver of the other car, Christian Powers. He runs a routine check on Powers' driving record and discovers that the 57-year-old man has been involved in three other accidents in the last two years. As a result of the last crash, Powers' license had been revoked, but restored shortly afterwards. When you go in and you see, oh, OK, he had a license revocation. And what are these other accidents about? I had a little bit of information about him that maybe he didn't know that I had. Christian Powers tells Detective Keenan that he woke up at about 5.30 that morning to get an early start on his weekend vacation. He'd been on the road a lot since his retirement, visiting many of the campgrounds in the eastern U.S. So far, Keenan is sensing nothing out of the ordinary. Powers' blood test comes back negative, so intoxication is also ruled out. Then Powers makes a shocking admission. The last thing he remembers is turning onto a road about five miles before the crash site. Five miles before the accident scene was the last thing he remembered. And all he could think of was, oh my god, how did, how did nobody else die? If he was telling me the truth that that was five miles before the accident scene, that was pretty amazing that he didn't hit somebody else. The lack of brake marks now makes sense. For more than five miles, Powers claims to have been unaware that he was even driving. Now, Robert needs to find out why. He asks him if he was on any medication or whether he has any medical conditions. And sure enough, as soon as Robert asks him about the other crashes and why his license had been revoked, Powers immediately refuses to answer any more questions and demands an attorney. Talk to me. That threw flags up in the air right away, too. You know, if you're going to talk to me about the accidents, well, why won't you talk to me about why your license was revoked? And he wouldn't, I mean, go see my attorney. That's pretty stiff. But Christian Power's silence may be Robert's first lead. When I left the hospital, I went back and looked exactly what I had. I had a very high-speed accident, had no brake marks. I had a scenario that this man had blacked out, doesn't know what happened. There was something definitely wrong with him. Coming up, Robert Keenan digs deeper into the suspect's driving and medical background and uncovers some astonishing information. He's out on the road every day putting people's lives in danger. Accident investigator Robert Keenan needs to find out why Christian Powers never hit the brakes before rear-ending Jody Morris's car and killing the pregnant woman. 
The answer could have serious ramifications for both Powers and Jody's family. Detective Keenan's next step is to look into Powers' previous three accidents. First, Robert follows up on the most recent one. The police report says that Powers had driven straight into the back of a car waiting at a light. Robert can't believe it. It's an almost identical crash. He's saying basically the same thing. And it's like, there's something wrong with this guy. There's really something wrong with this guy. Robert learns that Powers had been admitted to the hospital with minor injuries. His cousin had attended his admittance and informed the doctor that Powers suffered from epilepsy. But when the doctor asked him about it, Powers had denied having any medical conditions. Positive, I'm not an epileptic. Epilepsy is a chronic disorder of the nervous system that can result in sudden attacks and seizures. These episodes can be associated with convulsions, loss of consciousness, and abnormal behavior. What happens with a seizure is there's an abnormal electrical impulse in the brain, like a spark. And all of a sudden, that spark can trigger other sparks. And so instead of going down the normal neurological pathway, like making a phone call from your brain to your arm, so to speak, all of a sudden, there'll be multiple phone calls at one time and everything, the whole switchboard's lighting up. And instead of having to reset the computer with control at the leap, what happens is people progress. An arm will start to twitch. It'll progress to a leg. It'll go to the other arm. It'll go to the face. Close to 250,000 Canadians suffer from epilepsy. Every year, more than 15,000 people learn they have epilepsy. There was a time when epileptics simply could not get a driver license, but times have changed, and many with this affliction can overcome that restriction through proper treatment and have become safe and reliable drivers with the proper safeguards in place. Now, each state has its own regulations, but generally speaking, a six-month period certified by a doctor that's seizure-free will allow someone with this disease to get a license. Despite Powers' claim that he was in perfect health, his license was revoked pending a medical review. But then Robert learns that the suspect's license had been restored after another doctor reported that Powers showed no indication of epileptic seizures. Digging deeper into the medical records, Robert discovers a very disturbing fact. Powers has four different doctors. This strikes Robert as very suspicious. He's Dr. Shaw. He's looking for someone to write him a get well card so he could get his license back. Robert learns that Powers has been lying about his condition. According to the medical file, he has in fact been treated for epilepsy by one of the doctors and has a long-term prescribed anti-seizure medication. So all I can assume is that he wasn't taking his medication and that he had this problem. And he was denying it to the medical profession. And that makes him you know, grossly negligent and reckless in his manner. After examining all the evidence, the district attorney charges Robert Powers with one count of homicide by vehicle, one count of manslaughter, and reckless driving. However, the suspect's attorney files a habeas corpus, essentially saying that there was no crime. The attorney for uh, Mr. Powers stated that because uh, the Department of Transportation had addressed the situation and Re reinstated his license after revocation, that it was their fault that this accident occurred and not Mr. Powell. To Robert's disbelief, the judge dismisses the charges. I was shocked beyond belief. I was mad. I was actually angry. Robert is determined to see this case through its rightful end. But to refile the charges, Robert needs new evidence. He racks his brain to think of something he might have overlooked. In my old clues was, were the medical records and the accident report all talked about the cousin. Well, I hadn't spoken to the cousin. I went back and I told him about Mr. Powers getting off. Apparently, even as a small child, Powers had suffered grand mal seizures that involved loss of consciousness and falling down. The cousin goes on to say that he'd always suspected that his cousin was not monitoring his condition or treating it responsibly, but he never thought that it might come to this. Robert asks the cousin if he would be willing to testify. He agrees. 
Then, just as Robert is preparing to circle back with the district attorney, he gets some news that will send his entire investigation into overdrive. I get a phone call from uh, the district, uh, District 2 lieutenant, and he says, hey, do you know this guy, Powers? And I said, yeah, I do. And he says, well, he had an accident here in the park. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, I'm not. And he faxed me a copy of the accident report, and here, again, he tells the, the local officer who took the report that I blacked out, I don't remember what happened. Robert gathers all the new evidence, the testimonies from the cousin and the new accident report filed just days before the initial charges were dismissed. He is now ready to refile accusations. Nobody could ignore it this time. And, and I felt very confident that we would get a conviction. After a two week long investigation, investigators can finally paint a picture of what happened to Jody Morris on her last day alive. Christian Powers is a diagnosed epileptic, but he's not taking his medication. In the last two years, he caused multiple crashes after blacking out behind the wheel. Powers is on the road again when he begins to experience another seizure. In a semi-conscious state, he speeds up to 70 miles per hour. As Jody Morris notices him in her rearview mirror, there is no time to react. He rear-ends her at full speed, killing the 24-year-old pregnant woman instantly. At trial, testimony is given asserting that Powers has misled several police officers about his epilepsy. Evidence also shows that he duped doctors into submitting medical claims reporting that he was seizure-free and fit to drive. He took the stand during the trial, and he said that he didn't take his medication because it made him feel yucky. It didn't make him feel good. The judge cannot dismiss the overwhelming evidence and sentences Christian Powers to three to six years in prison with eight years of probation for manslaughter and reckless endangerment. In my career, I would say it's one of the cases that has made me feel that I've really done something for this community. Next, the body of a bus driver is found under his own bus, but the strange scenario baffles even the most seasoned of investigators. Technologies work to make not only cars, but driving in general a lot safer. Airbags, analog brakes, heads-up display, all of those have made cars and the driving experience safer for everyone concerned. Now, technology also works in the favor of the accident investigator. Some of the data from the car, for example, can be used in accident investigation. Computer programs and all the advancements there make that accident investigator's job that much easier. But this next case will show that all the technology in the world will never replace hard work and good old-fashioned investigative skills. In late summer of 1995, an office worker shows up at his regular bus stop for the first leg of a long commute home. The bus is already there, but strangely, it's sitting up on the sidewalk and the motor is still running. He looks around for the driver, but there's no sign of him anywhere. And then, as he takes a seat on the curb to wait, he makes a shocking discovery. There's a body pinned beneath the enormous vehicle. When reconstructionist John Northrup shows up at the scene, the bus is still idling on the sidewalk. It doesn't look like it's been in a crash. Nevertheless, he's got a dead body under extremely mysterious circumstances, and his job is to find out why. The victim was under the front axle of the bus on one of her sides, but the legs were actually bent up behind the back. I knew it was going to be interesting with the, the way the bus was and the victim was under the bus. I knew it was going to be a long road. The body is identified as 42-year-old Brian Bodrick, He's a veteran bus driver, well-liked by both his co-workers and passengers. Even to a trained investigator like John, it's a horrific sight and remarkably unique. Brian has literally been crushed between the pavement and the undercarriage. John is told that the bus was still in gear, the door was open, and that the parking brake was off when the first officer arrived on the scene. Right away, there are two possible scenarios that come to John's mind. Could have been a mechanical failure where the bus, after the driver got off, just took off on its own. 
or someone could have made the bus move or actually driven the bus over the top of the victim. Every vehicle in the fleet has an interlocking braking security system specially made for buses. If the doors are open, the brake automatically comes on, and the bus can't move whether it's in gear or not. The system is in place for the safety of passengers getting on and off the bus. They could also get off the bus and leave it with just that service brake in neutral, but the parking brake is not on. Once John's inspection of the body is complete, Brian Bodrick is pulled out from underneath the bus and transported to the local morgue. His next step is to send an officer to a nearby library to see if anyone inside heard or saw anything. Surprisingly, the officer returns just after a few minutes with a young woman named Simone Davies. She was one of the last two passengers on the bus when it pulled into the layover stop. The young lady who was the, the second passenger on the bus indicated the gentleman on the bus was upset that he had missed this bus stop, apparently because he was asleep. And the bus driver was explaining to him that it wasn't a big deal, 10 or 15 minutes at the layover, and he would drive him back the same way. Suddenly, foul play is looking like a much stronger possibility. John immediately sends out a search team with a description of the man seen arguing with the driver. The chances were very slim, but we'd probably be able to find him. If this person had had anything to do with it, chances are they were trying to get away, run away, hide. But as John is about to examine the bus, he gets another incredible break. An officer has located a man in a nearby park fitting the description of the missing witness. Eric Rickles is a 19-year-old unemployed welder who appears to have been drinking. John asks for Rickles to be taken to the police station and held for questioning. He told us at the beginning, I wasn't even on the bus. We have a witness that said, yes, he was on the bus. Yes, he was talking to the bus driver. Something's going on. He's not being truthful. With the body removed, John is now able to move about the scene freely. The bus is approximately 100 feet from its usual layover spot and had only come to a stop because it hit a railing. It obviously wasn't going at a high speed and there are no acceleration or skid marks at all. How Brian ended up underneath his own bus is a complete mystery. Then, while John is making his measurement of the curb, he notices a marking on the sidewalk. There's a chip in the granite smeared with grease or dirt. This could be important. Uh, the chip here could be, it looks fairly fresh. It could have been where a suspension member of the bus or the axle uh, struck as it came up on the curb. It's roughly aligned with the right side of the bus. I'm hoping to find some kind of a mark under the bus to, to link up. Coming up, John Northrup decides to recreate the last minutes of the victim's life. John Northrup is at a crossroads in his investigation to find out how bus driver Brian Bodrick ended up under his own bus. Minutes before his death, a witness says that he saw Brian arguing with a passenger, Eric Rickles, but Rickles denies it. Other than that, John has a bizarre accident scene with precious little to go on. We're still back to, was this a mechanical failure of the bus, or was it something where uh, someone intentionally did something and ran the driver over? The next step is for John to get under the bus. Although the buses are washed regularly, they still collect road grime and grease. Right away, he sees that there's a wiping mark cutting through the grime. It goes from the front bumper back towards the axle where Brian's body was found. It appears the victim or his clothing actually wiped some road film off the underside of the bumper towards the left side of the bus, which gives me a good idea where the victim came underneath the front end of the bus. And then he notices a small white mark on the steering axle. The metal's actually abraded or dented just a little bit with fresh metal underneath telling me that that's an excellent point where the bus most likely would have struck the curb making that chip that I saw. The rest of the forensic mechanical inspection comes back clean. Everything on the bus is in perfect working order, including the brakes and the interlocking systems. John is now forced to conclude that it was somebody, not something, that caused the bus to travel. 
It ruled out the accidental or equipment failure aspect. This vehicle, to move from where it was with the doors open, had to have some sort of human involvement, which meant we needed to speak with Rickles. John leaves the garage and heads over to the station. Eric Rickles is sober now, and his story changes completely. He admits that he had a fight with the driver because he missed his stop. But after Brian agreed to take him back on the return route, Eric calmly reboarded the bus to wait. And that's when he claims that the bus just started to move. A few seconds later, it just stopped. Rickles swears he was sitting at the back of the bus and had no idea that Brian had been run over. Then he says he just got off. He was already late to meet a friend and figured by now it would be faster to walk. I didn't believe Rickles. Rickles is upset with Brian, and he gets back on the bus and he says, fine, I'll show you. I'll close the door. Anyone who rides the bus as regular would know the hand lever is what opens and closes the door. And if it was just there with the door open, when he closed the door, the bus would have moved forward. But there's a few things not adding up for John. Why didn't Brian Bodrick simply move out of the way? The bus wouldn't have been going fast at all. And John thinks back at where the bus ended up. He's not sure that a rolling bus would have the energy to mount the curb with enough force to chip the sidewalk. The next question I had was, would the bus climb up on the curb by itself? And uh, speaking with uh, other people and bus drivers, people at bus company, they actually thought the bus would not, just to release the brake at an idle, go up onto the curb the way that it did. The ME's autopsy report comes in, but it's not what Detective Northrup expected. It confirms that Brian Bodrick died from something called positional asphyxia. Well, positional asphyxia is essentially um, a situation where a person has got himself in a position where his windpipe is shut off, or he's in a position where something is constricting his chest so it can't expand and the end result is that he suffocates. He can't get air in. And depending on the situation, it can be sudden, like something falls on you, or it can be something where your chest can expand a little bit. This is a shocking finding. Brian did not die from injuries sustained as a result of the bus hitting or dragging him. On the contrary, Brian was most likely still alive when the bus came to a stop but his awkward position underneath the vehicle left him unable to breathe. Now there is just one question to answer. Did Rickles actually accelerate into Brian Bodrick? The ramifications could be significant for any criminal case. When I can't figure something out, I try and go out and do it again uh, without breaking anything big or killing myself. To prove this one way or the other, John takes the bus back to the crash site to reconstruct the accident. I took the bus back to the scene originally. I got on the bus and released the parking brake and then closed the door, and the bus rolled forward at an idle. The rubber on the wheels hit the curb, but none of the suspension members of the axle or anything hit the curb to make another chip like I'd seen before. When I accelerated the bus three of the four times, the suspension member actually hit the curb and made a chip similar to the one I saw the night of the accident. This is the final piece of the puzzle for John. It suggests to the investigator that Rickles not only tripped the parking brake, but actually accelerated into Bodrick. And it makes more sense. The driver would more easily be trapped underneath the bus if the bus was accelerating and he was in front, as opposed to a nice, slow idle up to the curb. After 16 hours of investigation, police now have a working theory as to what happened in the tragic moments that led up to Brian's tragic death. It's the last stop on Brian Bodrick's 7.15 run into town. But one of his passengers, Eric Rickles, is not happy. He missed his stop. Let's go now. Let's go now. Just bring me back now. Let's go After a brief argument out on the sidewalk, Rickles decides to take matters into his own hands. He closes the door as tripping the parking brake and sets the bus in motion. Panic, Brian runs round to the driver's side window to try and reach in to switch the parking lever. Rickles steps on the gas. Tragically, Brian loses his footing and is dragged under the bus. He survives the impact, but is trapped in such a way that he's unable to take in enough oxygen, and Brian dies of positional asphyxia. 
Rickles flees as soon as he realized what happened. Eric Rickles was sentenced to three and a half to ten and a half years in jail for second degree manslaughter. John Northrup was able to piece together a puzzling and complicated case. Accident investigator can always go back to the physical evidence. Won't lie, won't let you down. Physical evidence is the backbone of any strong case and is our best guarantee of making sure the right people get punished for their actions.